Hey, it's Michelle, your CLC Biology Tutor again. Welcome back to the Know the Differences series in which I go through with you the important terms that you need to understand. In this video, I'll be looking at the components of the blood. So that means we'll be looking at the plasma, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. Now, these are the four components of the blood, and you need to be able to differentiate between them in terms of their structure and their functions. So let's begin with the plasma. Now the plasma is the fluid portion of the blood. So this is what makes blood a liquid. Now it is responsible for transporting water, soluble nutrients, hormones, and blood clotting factors. All of them have an important use in the blood. Now key points to remember about the plasma. So as I mentioned just now, it is a fluid portion of the blood and it is yellow as you can see in the picture with the medical bag holding the plasma. So it is a yellow fluid part of the blood and it also makes up the largest percentage of the blood components. So I mentioned there are four blood components and the plasma actually makes up the largest percentage. After all, it is the fluid part of the blood so you would expect it to be the majority of the blood components. All right, so let's move on from the plasma. So that is a fluid part of the blood carrying lots of useful substances. Now let's look at the red blood cells. Now the red blood cells are important for transporting oxygen. Now we know that oxygen is needed for respiration to produce energy. So red blood cells are extremely important in this, this function. Now the key points to remember about red blood cells in terms of their structure, there are these biconcave discs with thin walls. And if you look at the picture, you can see that the rims of the red blood cells tend to be a little more thick, thicker than the inside the center portion. So that's why it's meant by biconcave. And then another point to note is that red blood cells, they have a slight elasticity to them. They are able to squeeze through narrow capillaries. So remember capillaries are very, very small blood vessels. So the red blood cells need to be able to pass through them and get from point A to point B. So they have to have that elasticity to make it, make it um, able to get through the capillaries. Now the next point, very important to note, red blood cells do not have a nucleus. So we are familiar that all cells have a nucleus which controls the various functions and activities in the cell. But the red blood cell is different. So there's no nucleus. And the reason for this is that the nucleus takes up some space in the cell. And the red blood cell's main interest is in transporting the red pigment hemoglobin. So as you will see in the next point, the cytoplasm actually contains this red pigment hemoglobin. So we need more space for this hemoglobin to be transported. So the no nucleus is needed. So we want the hemoglobin to take up the majority of the space within the red blood cells. And it is this hemoglobin molecule that would attach, that would attract the oxygen and allow the red blood cells to transport that oxygen around the body. So hemoglobin is very, very important in that. It's a protein molecule with iron constituents. So this is a red pigment and this is what makes red blood cells red. And this is what gives the blood its color, its red color. And then the final point, red blood cells are actually the most numerous of all the cells in the blood. So out of the red blood cells, white blood cells, and the platelets, the red blood cells will be the most numerous. So they actually contain approximately, there are actually approximately 5 million red blood cells per microliters. And that is the size of a pinhead. So just imagine, one little pinhead contains about 5 million red blood cells. So it sounds crazy, but that is the truth. So these are the key points to note about the red blood cells. Let's move on to look at the white blood cells. Now the white blood cells are known as the immune cells. They are there for defense against pathogens. So you should remember that pathogens or any organism, any microorganism that comes into the body. So this includes viruses, bacteria, fungi, worms, anything that the body should not have. So the white blood cells are responsible for fighting against these pathogens and getting rid of them. 
So that's why they're an important part of the immune system. Now the key points to know about the white blood cells is that there are two types. We have the phagocytes and the lymphocytes. Now the phagocytes are the ones that are responsible for engulfing and destroying the pathogens. So they're like the cell eaters, the pathogen eaters. So they engulf the bacteria and the viruses. And you would notice about the phagocytes, which you can see here at the top, the first picture, the phagocytes actually are easily recognized by their lobe-shaped nucleus. So the nucleus is not just a regular round nucleus. It is made up of these lobes and the cytoplasm of the phagocytes are also usually granular. And this helps with the digestion of the pathogens. So just remember, phagocytes are the eaters, they engulf the pathogens and destroy them. So that those digestive enzymes that are released from the granular cytoplasm, they would help to digest and to break up and to pretty much destroy the pathogens. So the one, the top cell is the, the phagocyte, and then the second cell, the second white blood cell, these are the lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes are responsible for producing antibodies, which would bind to the pathogens. So the lymphocytes and the phagocytes, they actually work very closely together. So imagine the lymphocytes as the one that would produce the antibodies, and these antibodies act as tags on the surfaces of the pathogens, and that would help clump them together, and then the phagocytes can recognize them, these tag pathogens, and then engulf them. So they work closely together. And you would know, you will see here in the, the picture that the lymphocyte has a, a larger nucleus and is more rounded in shape. So that is how you can easily identify a lymphocyte. So the nucleus is a key feature to note in order to differentiate between the phagocyte and the lymphocyte if you were looking at it under a microscope. So the lymphocyte has that large round nucleus and the cytoplasm is non-granular. After all, it has no interest in engulfing the pathogens like the phagocytes. So the lymphocytes are strictly there to produce antibodies and help tag the pathogens so that the pathogens can clump up together and then the phagocytes can work on engulfing those pathogens. All right, let's move on to look at the final component, the platelets. Now platelets are important for blood clotting. So when we get a cut and we start to bleed, we don't want to bleed out forevermore. So we need to have blood clotting occurring. So the platelets are crucial in components in the blood clotting process. So they're pretty much just fragments of cell. These biconvex fragments of cells, they have an irregular shape. So just think of them as cell pieces. And they have no nucleus, of course, because they're just cell fragments. So when these activated, when these platelets are activated, they then begin the whole process of blood clotting to help stop the blood from, from escaping from the body. Hopefully by now you have a better understanding of the structure of the, the blood components and their functions. Here in this, in this slide here you can see that the blood components are represented in a centrifuge tube. So this is if you were to take a, a tube, put it in a machine known as a centrifuge and it spins down the blood so it can separate into these these layers as you're seeing in the tube. So you can see the largest component as I would have mentioned before is the plasma. So that floats to the top which is and it's the lightest, is the liquid portion. So we would expect it to float to the top. The middle layer, the thin layer, consists of the the white blood cells and the platelets that's often known as the buffy layer and then the final layer would be the red blood cells and they actually would be the heaviest because they're the most numerous in the blood so these are the blood components as it would appear in a centrifuge tube after the blood has been spun down to separate the components into these three different layers so I hope now you know the differences between these blood components, the plasma, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets.